Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold Home. And this is our regular weekly message. Today's message is entitled, From Everlasting to Everlasting, because that is who Jesus is. Jesus is from everlasting to everlasting. Jesus was, is, and will forever be the Lord God Almighty. And that, my friends, is the gospel truth. Turn with me, please, to our scripture, which is found in Psalms 90, verses 1 and 2. Lord, you have been a dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Yes, from everlasting to everlasting. Jesus is God. He's not a created being who found his existence in a little town called Bethlehem just over 2,000 years ago. And he most certainly is not Lucifer, nor is he the brother of Michael. For more on that, see our video, Five Biblical Statements That Claim Jesus Is God Under Our Nuggets of Truth category. Also see did Jesus say he was Lucifer also in our nuggets of truth category? You see, Jesus is none of these. Jesus is God, and he also claimed to be God. Although some people who are not familiar with the scriptures or who through deceitful practices try to confuse people and cause them to doubt the divinity of Jesus, they will say that Jesus never claimed to be God, which is a downright lie. When addressing the Jews, Jesus explained that he existed before Abraham was even born. I want us to read those four verses. This is really interesting. John chapter 8, verses 56 through 59. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Did you? notice what Jesus said. He said, your father Abraham and not our father Abraham. Jesus was making a distinction between himself and them. Look at what he said when he was teaching his disciples how to pray. Matthew chapter 6 verse 9. Our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. See, he includes himself in that prayer. He said, our father, meaning my father and your father. But Abraham, not so much, because he created Abraham. Therefore, Jesus made a distinction between himself and the Jews by claiming to be God. To us, it is no big deal because we don't really understand Jewish thought or Jewish thinking. But to the Jews, the Jewish people, the phrase, I am, is revered and reserved only for God and for God alone. When Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, it infuriated them because he was calling himself God. This is the reason they picked up stones to stone him with. They were going to stone him for what? For blasphemy. Not because of anything he said about Abraham, but because he now identified as being God. To them, that was blasphemous. But that is not the only time Jesus identified with being God. During the Feast of Dedication in the winter time, while Jesus was walking in the temple, the Jews came up to him. They plainly asked him, he said, tell us, plainly tell us if you are the Messiah. 
This is the interaction. John chapter 10, verse 23 through 30. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I tell you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe, because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again, Jesus claims to be God. And again, the Jews pick up stones with which to stone him with. Let us take a look at that transaction, the very next verse. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Listen to their reply. The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. Jesus never plainly said the words, I am God, worship me. But he did accept worship and he did claim to be God. Otherwise, why would the Pharisees and the Jews accuse him of blaspheming? And why would they want to stone him if not that he claimed divinity? The other thing that people are saying or, or, or they're trying to say about Jesus is that he only showed up in the Bible in the New Testament. We've never heard of Jesus before. And then Paul attributes divinity to him in the New Testament. Well, that is not so. Again, that is another lie or another misunderstanding of scripture. Because in the Old Testament, every time you read about the angel of the Lord, that is talking about Jesus. When it says that the word of the Lord came to that person, that is again talking about Jesus. I'm pretty sure that you've heard of the Council of Nicaea. Even if you're not sure exactly what went on during the Council of Nicaea, you've at least heard about the Council of Nicaea. Well, the first Council of Nicaea's main function, among other things, yes, but the main function was to determine the validity of the issue of the divine nature of God the Son and his relationship to God the Father. In other words, was Jesus God? A priest by the name of Arius began to teach the heretical doctrine that denied that Jesus was the Son of God. It denied that Jesus was God in the same sense that the Father was God. His teacher declared that Jesus, the Son, is not eternal, but is created when he was conceived by Mary through the Holy Spirit. There he had his beginning. It was so divided the empire that the emperor, Constantine I, or Constantine the Great, called a council to be held in Nicaea in the month of May of the year AD 324. Although 
The emperor had invited all 1,800 bishops of the Christian church within the Roman Empire. Only somewhere between 250 and 318 bishops showed up to the meeting. They each brought with them two priests and three deacons. And the emperor Constantine himself also attended the meeting. So to make a long story short, it was confirmed at the Council of Nicaea that Jesus is God, the incarnate God as the gospel proclaims and as Paul preached and as Jesus himself taught. There was never a time that the Son was not. He always, and I repeat, he always existed. The scriptures teaches, albeit not very clearly, but the scriptures does preach a triune God. From the very first words of scripture, we see at the very least a multifarious description of our God. When the book of, uh, of Genesis states this in Genesis chapter one, verse one, in the beginning, God, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This word translated God is the Hebrew word Elohim which is grammatically plural, but the meaning is singular, according to the dictionary of biblical languages with Semitic domains. So why is that? Why is that word grammatically plural, but the meaning is singular? Because God is three, yet one. He is plural, yet singular. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord, is one. Look at John's description in his gospel. He writes, John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Who is this word that was in the beginning with God, and who was and is God? Well, let us skip down to verse 14 and find out. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was, is, and will always be God. He is from everlasting to everlasting. But some argue, and I must say, make a really good point. They ask, if Jesus was God, then why did he pray to God? The answer, however, is really quite simple. You have to understand that the divine nature is different from the human nature. When Jesus came to the earth, he took on human nature. In other words, he came as a man in order to redeem man. Why? Why did he have to become man to redeem man? Another good question. But for that answer, let me point you to our Bible study, The Kinsman Redeemer, part one and two. Jesus had to take on the form of man, meaning he became fully man. He was 100% man while staying fully God, 100% God. But he did not use his Godhood, but rather he laid it all aside. He laid his divinity aside so that he could operate, so that he could be man in order to redeem man. Therefore, being 100% man, Jesus had to depend on God the Father and on the Holy Spirit. He only did what was told him to do. He only did what he heard. He only said what he heard in those years that he ministered on the earth as 100% man. 
When he put aside his divine nature in order to function as 100% man, in order to redeem man, he limited himself. By his own will, mind you, he limited himself to function within the limits of his human nature. He never gave up his divine nature. He only chose not to access his divine nature. Therefore, prayer was his connection to the divine. It was his connection to the Father, as it was for Peter, James, John, Jude and the great apostle Peter and for every Christian who has ever been born, who has ever served the Lord. As a man or a woman, we cannot function in our Christian lives without our connection to the divine, which is through prayer. Prayer is our connection to God, the divine. And that is the reason why Jesus prayed so much because of his connection and his limitation as being man by his own will. One of Jesus' secondary jobs in coming to earth is to show us how to live a holy life through prayer and through worship of the Father as a mere human, as with the human nature. But someone might say, okay, Brother Kenny, that's good. But listen, the Bible says that God is not a man. What about that? And I say, well, another good question. So let us read that verse. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? This is the Old Testament, and the Old Testament does not take into consideration the incarnation of Jesus. Why? Because at that time, at the time of that writing, Jesus was still the angel of the Lord. This understanding of God was not revealed to Balaam, who was the one who uttered those words in his discourse to Balak, when Balak hired him to curse the, the, the Israelites who had just come out of the land of Egypt and they were still in the plains of Moab. Look at what Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter three, verse five, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So there, Paul confirms that. That revelation was not given to the man of old, to that generation. But someone would say, okay, but what about Hosea chapter 11, verse nine? This is God himself speaking. All right, well, let's read that verse. Hosea chapter 11, verse nine. I will not execute my burning anger I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Again, let us take into consideration what we said about the revelation not being given at that time of the writing. But also, let us think about this. Jesus, as a man, was not given the authority to execute God's burning anger, nor to pour out his wrath on man, but rather he came into the world as a man to redeem man. I want us to look at two verses. John chapter three, verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And now John chapter 12, verse 47. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Therefore, as a man, God does not judge, nor does he pour out his wrath on mankind. Judgment is reserved for God and for God alone. It's reserved for that day when you stand before the great white throne judgment. 
Okay, what about John chapter 14, verse 28 then? It says, you heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. If Jesus was equal to God and of the same substance, then why did Jesus say that the Father is greater than he? And they like, mic drop. Go ahead. I'll wait. Well, I'd say this is another really good question. So let me give you a really good answer. God the Father is greater than Jesus the Son in role only, but not in divine nature. They are of the same substance, with the same unlimited power, the same unlimited knowledge, the same unlimited wisdom. They are in fact one and the same, but they operate in different roles. Jesus, as the obedient son, submits to the Father, making him greater in role only. Just remember gyro, G-I-R-O, greater in role only. That's the reason why Jesus said that it's expedient for him to go back to the Father so that he could send the Holy Spirit. His role has now changed. He is no longer the suffering servant, but he's the risen Savior, the Lord God Almighty, and of the same eternal substance as the Father. After his death and resurrection and ascension into heaven, Jesus sat down at the right hand of power the right hand of the Father, and took back his role onto himself of running the world. Look at what John the Baptist's conclusion was about who Jesus is. John chapter 1, verse 29 through 34. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. G John said that Jesus was before him, yet John was older than Jesus according to birth. John also said that he got it from a good source that Jesus was, in fact, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus claimed to be the Son of God because Jesus was from eternity to eternity. Yes, many times Jesus accepted worship. People say he didn't accept worship. Yes, he did. Read the Bible. Read your Bible. Pick it up. Open it up. Turn to Matthew chapter 8, verse 2. Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. Matthew 14, verse 33. Matthew 15, verse 25. Matthew 20, verse 20. Even Thomas, who is sometimes called Doubting Thomas because of his lack of belief in the resurrection, claimed, this is what he proclaimed, my Lord and my God. When he saw the risen Savior, he could say nothing else but my Lord and my God, and he worshiped him. Many others worshiped Jesus as well, like the blind man who Jesus healed in John chapter nine, verse 38. He too worshiped Jesus. Jesus is God, and he's the only way to salvation, for it is written in, in Acts chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, 
which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Peter also spoke up during Jesus' earthly ministry and said, Lord, you alone have the words of life. Who has eternal life? But God and God alone has eternal life. So if Jesus alone has the words of eternal life, then Jesus is God. And if Jesus is God, then you ought to worship him. Let me ask you, have you met Jesus? Have you come to Jesus to have your sins washed away? He is the only way to eternity, to eternal life. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can, it's easy. All you have to do is to repeat this prayer after me, mean it, believe it in your heart, that he has forgiven you, and then you live for him from now on. That's all you gotta do. It's based on faith. So if you're ready to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, just repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me, Lord. Help me to walk the straight and narrow path. Help me to put my faith in your son, Jesus. For I believe that he came in the flesh, that he died for sinners, that he rose again on the third day, and now he's seated at the right hand, at your right hand. And I believe that he's coming back to get us one day. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you for lavishing salvation upon us. I accept it now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He will give you a new life. He'll give you a new start. He will bless you with blessings upon blessings. Eternity with him is now your home. What you need to do is to get a Bible, take it off your bookshelf, dust it off, or go out and buy one if you don't have one. Go out and buy a Bible and read that Bible every day. Study your Bible, highlight the Bible, memorize those verses. Find a Bible-believing church who believes in the power of Almighty God, who believes in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who believes in signs and wonders and miracles who believes in healing because these signs and wonders will follow those who believe. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that you should be doing. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And there you'll be with him forever and ever. No more heart, no more pain, no more hunger, no more thirst, nothing but. No more fears. Jesus will provide everything you will ever want or ever need. Thank you so much for joining us. Jesus loves you. We love you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.